From the dawn of civilization, the honeybee has symbolized hard work, unity, and cooperation. These furry insects live in colonies where every bee works for the good of the whole. At the heart of a colony of thousands, there is but one queen. While she lays eggs, her daughters, the worker bees, run the hive, taking on different roles during their lifespan. Nurse bees care for the queen and baby bees. Guard bees protect the hive from invaders, and forage bees venture out from the hive to gather food and water to share with their colony. Honey bees from one hive can visit more than 100,000 flowers in a single day. Finding a flower in bloom, a honey bee collects pollen for food and nectar to make honey. The sweet nectar and nourishing pollen are her reward for carrying out one of the most important tasks in nature, pollination. Pollination is primarily dependent upon either of two factors, insects or the wind. The bee's body picks up pollen grains as it brushes against the anthers in a flower. When the bee alights on another flower, the pollen adhering to its body rubs off onto the stigma of that flower. The success of the flower depends upon that moment of fertilization. Inside, the part that remains is the single cell that was formed by fertilization. It begins to grow until there are many cells which take shape into a seed, a seed within a fruit. A lot of people out there don't realize that one out of every three bites of food they stick in their mouth, these honeybees put on their dinner table. And if they're not here... We wouldn't have our fruits, we wouldn't have our vegetables. If we want a diet that is more than gruel, more than wheat, oats, corn, and rice, we need honeybees. But also, even the individual bee is just fascinating. It has been designed to do what it does, which is go out and collect pollen and honey and bring it back. So it's got all this hair. It builds up a static electricity when it's flying. So when it's in the flower, the pollen jumps on it. It's got special notches on its front legs to clean its antenna. Its antenna can smell. It can tell the temperature. It can measure oxygen and carbon dioxide and is an amazing, amazing thing. This might be one of the most interesting, disturbing, and puzzling stories to come along in a long time. Something is happening to the honeybees. Negli Stati Uniti è arrivato anche in Italia. Le api stanno scomparendo. È un problema grave. Regardez, c'est une ruche morte, une ruche vide, totalement abandonnée. Over 10 million bees have mysteriously disappeared in Taiwan recently, and beekeepers are having a tough time making money. Something is killing our honeybees in staggering numbers. The first beekeeper in the United States to bring these mysterious disappearances to light was David Hackenberg. Hackenberg owns and manages around 3,000 beehives and works with his son, Davy. Together, they bring bees to apple orchards, almond groves, pumpkin patches, and blueberry fields across the country. Hey, we'll see you in a little bit, boys. You know, I started, you know, I started keeping bees in 1962 as a high school vlog project. You know, I was born and raised in a dairy farm and raising veal calves. And, and we liked honey, so I got a hive of bees in 1962. In the spring of 1962, I got this hive of bees, you know. And, my mother said that'll go away quick. You get stung once or twice, you know. But it didn't. And by the time I got out of high school, I had a couple hundred hives. And, and we joke about getting stung. You know, you get stung and you become a beekeeper. Hey. You got a pallet or what? I got honey. I got box full of honey. What we're doing is we're going through these bees and getting them ready to go to California. We gotta get them all over in clean pallets. We're making sure they're all good looking beehives. About two trailer loads, about 800 and some, hopefully. 
We were hoping to send three loads, but we just keep losing. In October 2006, Dave Hackenberg discovered massive honeybee losses and announced them to the world. The discovery thrust him into the spotlight and created quite a buzz. Let me introduce Dave Hackenberg. <laughs> this is really the gentleman that, that raised the red flags. He made enough noise to get people's attention. We thank him for that. Thank you. Where are the bees going? You know, why? Well, on November 12th, 2006 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we rolled into the yard of bees in south of Tampa, Florida, at Ruskin, Florida, to pick up 400 hives of bees, and they were empty. You know, there was no bees in the boxes. They were, you know, 36 of them still had anything from a handful to a good-looking beehive, but for the most part, most of them. And, and three weeks before that, they were, they were good beehives. And that all became news on early February of, of 2007 when it hit the Philadelphia Inquirer. The next day, yeah, I was in 487 newspapers around the world. Some of the nation's top scientists are trying to understand the phenomenon. But no one is more immersed in the mystery than the man who is widely credited with discovering it. The bees were all gone. They're gone. I mean, where'd they go? Don't know. I mean, I literally got down and crawled around. I mean, seriously, I got down on my hands and knees and crawled around, and then there's no dead bees. There are no dead bees anywhere. I mean, you can't find any bees. They flew off someplace. And never came back. Never came home. I've known David Hackenberg for, I don't know, 20 plus years. Um, we're, we're both East Coast beekeepers. We, we go to some of the same farms in Maine. I've known Dave and his brother Eli since they were kids. I met them on the road. They were trucking bees north. And... There's been times when, when I've needed help and I've called on him and, and the same thing when it was times when he's needed help. We, we call each other and, and you know, it, we, we call it therapy. We, we call each other a couple times a day. It's, it's almost therapy for us to talk back and forth because you, it's difficult. Your, your bees are dying and, and you know, a lot of people think it's your, own fa it's your fault. You know, he's always been a good friend, but when his bees just really uh, fell apart, I started calling him on a daily basis. I joke about this uh, just to keep him off a suicide watch, but um, in some ways that's not a joke. Scientist Dennis Van Inglesdorp monitors bee health in the state of Pennsylvania. When Hackenberg reported the inexplicable losses, Van Inglesdorp was one of the first called to the scene. David Hackenberg started very loudly complaining about this condition in November. And we required a David Hackenberg because now it's pretty clear that some other people have been suffering this condition. And he was right. Reports of catastrophic honeybee losses arrive from beekeepers across the United States, as well as Taiwan, Argentina, China, France, Italy, and many other countries. All around the planet, bees were disappearing, and no one knew why. In early 2007, U.S. scientists formed a task force to study the vanishing bees. They identified the distinct symptoms and named the phenomenon colony collapse disorder. The symptoms of colony collapse are the fact that you're, when a colony is completely dead, you're finding no bees in the colony or in the apiary. Um, you're also not finding any of these known pathogens like varroa mite or honeybee trachea mite that would explain the loss. And if there are bees left in the colony, you only find a handful of very young bees and the queen. And we know that it was a rapid loss because often you'll find lots of young bees or baby bees in the colony and you'd never expect bees to leave their young behind. So we see lots of young bees, but we don't find dead bees in the colony and we don't find dead bees in the apiary. They've flown away. So this apiary is a collection of colonies that we brought here uh, two months ago and they were colonies that we suspected had CCD. So this is an example where we only have a couple frames of bees and no other bees in there. This is a colony at the end stages of collapse. The queen isn't leaving and, uh, well, she, she may be sick, but she's not dying 
you like I mean we're not seeing uh, some of the last bees we see are the here's the queen here and you can see that's a nice patch of brood she's really trying and, and you can see eggs right up into the outside so she's trying very hard to build that population but the bees are dying faster they can be replaced now two colonies in fact have died and we're actually monitoring what's happening with them this looks awful but in reality I would have expected there to be much more significant damage. We actually opened one hive this morning to grade it and we came back in the afternoon and it had all gone away. 3,000 bees gone. Well, here's the bee hive these bee scientists found a couple days ago that was full of bees. Three hours later, nobody home. They just took off. have been transported by man to pollinate crops since the early days of Egypt. Ancient Egyptians floated hives on rafts down the Nile to follow the bloom. Today, honeybees are transported on semi-trucks and pollinate $15 billion worth of food annually in the U.S. alone. Commercial beekeepers like Dave Mendez don't make the majority of their income from honey rather from pollination contracts from farmers who rely on the beekeeping industry to produce fruits and vegetables. If you hit hot weather, you're uh -huh. going to need to water the bees in the evening. If you hit cool weather, then... Down. Right. Below 50 degrees, it's not good for them. But if you, if you ended up going across 10, uh, not that you will, but and you hit hot weather at the end of the day, just think, if you're, if you're thirsty, yeah. So the bees. They got loaded on a truck last night. They left uh, Fort Myers um, yesterday evening. It's probably going to be about four days of traveling. Those hives will land in Lost Hills, California, on uh, an almond orchard there. Uh, they will stay there approximately till the middle of March, and, and then they'll come back. So they will come somewhere back to Babcock Ranch. In the middle of May, we'll ship them up to Maine for blueberry pollination. They'll go almost to the Canadian border, uh, Washington County. From there, they'll, they'll go on a truck and they'll go to Massachusetts for cranberries. As soon as they're done with cranberries, they'll come back to uh, Florida and good chance they're going to go back on the ranch. When Media people ask me about what's going on with the bees. They always ask, well, gosh, is there going to be enough bees for pollination? What I try to emphasize is that that's part of the reason for worrying. But more than that is that bees are an indicator of environmental quality. When the bees are dying, something's wrong. And that's going to affect all of us. We, we, I, I, I've gone to several state conventions with my good friend Dave Hackenberg. Dave asked me, what, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to stop this? Um, we're supposed to figure this out. I don't know. Um, excuse me. I think this is beyond us. Well, these are all dead hives that we've had in. They're just sorting through equipment. And uh, it's an ag this is agony agonizing for these guys because this is they know this is their livelihood too. This is just one of our buildings that we have full of dead equipment. I've been in commercial beekeeping for, I'm the fifth generation in beekeeping. We've run into problems through the years, but this is a problem that we've never, ever seen before to this degree. Since Thanksgiving, we're here the second week of February, since Thanksgiving day, we've 
virtually lost the operation to the bees just dying. I don't really don't know what we're gonna do. It's, you know, we have some options that we're exploring that we don't, we don't know. Going out of business, Rick Smith bid a somber farewell to the family honeybee operation. It's pretty devastating and it's very painful. The solution is it now beyond me. People have had a long association with honeybees. And part of that association is because in the old world where bees were and people were, nothing is, is sweet. They don't have sugar cane. The only thing that's sweet is fruit. So you can imagine if you taste honey and you've never had sugar before, it's the nectar of the gods. This is quite an amazing thing. Honey was magical. It was medicinal. It was by far the oldest medicine. In ancient Egypt, it was used as a panacea for pretty much any sort of complaint that the human body might suffer from. The same in ancient Greece and Rome. In the ancient world, bees were thought to be prophetic. The behavior of bees and swarms was seen as omens. If bee swarms would settle on houses or temples, that was thought to be some kind of message or be some kind of a blessing. The bee clearly represents the female aspect of the divine in the fact that the queen is the centerpiece of the bee culture. And in antiquity, in Greco-Roman antiquity, the queen and the bees were associated with what I'm calling the sacred feminine, or just plainly, the goddess. Bees are a female society. All the worker bees are female and make up 95% of the population. They gather honey, build comb, protect the hive, and raise the young. The drones, male bees, serve only to mate with the queen. If these honey-producing matriarchies were prophetic in ancient times, what message do they hold for us today? The bees are saying, we need to open our consciousness again to the idea that there is both masculine aspect of deity and feminine aspect of deity. And these two have to come into balance again, honoring the body of the earth as mother. Honey hunting has been an integral part of human culture since the Paleolithic age. Rock paintings from South Africa to Spain depict tribesmen climbing trees surrounded by clouds of bees, or using a smoker to calm bees in their quest for liquid gold. To this day, honey gatherers venture into the dense rainforests of Malaysia, where they scale the Tuolong tree, the tallest tree in Asia. There, the giant bee, Apis dorsata, build their hives. In preparation for a honey hunt, Pak Tay fashions a smoker from strips of reed. The 84-year-old leads the honey hunts with his sons and grandsons, passing on this ancient tradition. Yeah. Cases of Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD, were documented in 35 states. 
scientists across the country combined forces, employing CSI-style tactics to find the cause. From Florida to California, scientists took samples of bees, wax, and pollen, then shipped them back to the lab for analysis. One challenge was that there were no dead bees left behind by CCD. Even so, their research unearthed a whole new set of questions. I was surprised when I started looking at how little I knew and how little there was to look at to figure out what was going on. There was some work done in the 30s and the 50s, um, but right now, when I, when I would dissect bees, I would dissect for a known thing. Okay, I'm looking for honeybee trachomites. This is how you do it. When we did some of the initial survey work with Penn State, we found, in fact, that these bees had just sort of every possible pathogen or disease possible. And that leads us to believe that there's some immune compromise going on. So something is making them susceptible to everything. A number of suspects were investigated, including the Varroa mite. These parasites feed on the bee's blood, transmit viruses, and lay eggs in the same cells as the baby bees. Another suspect was the fungal bacteria Nosema serrani, which makes it difficult for the bees to eat, leaving them too weak to forage. Also standing accused was the newly discovered Israeli acute paralysis virus, which was found in a large number of CCD hives. However, after extensive research, scientists concluded that though all three suspects were hurting the honeybees, none were the primary cause of colony collapse disorder. During their research, scientists uncovered many other theories as well, some worth investigating, some not. So I have heard everything from the rapture to um, it being a Russian conspiracy and the Russians have put genes in the bees and now are beaming satellite beams down to kill the bees. Um, and as a scientist, I can't say that it's not true, but it doesn't seem very likely. Um, cell phones was one that for some reason really caught on. It was a misrepresentation of a German paper and the guy who did it, you know, is saying, no, I didn't mean to make this linkage. But that, that continues to persist. Um, we don't think that's the cause, although we don't recommend beekeepers give cell phones to their bees because they're social insects and will likely bankrupt you because they'll call so much and they'll only pollinate blackberries. What has happened is beekeepers have become very good at replacing dead hives. An average beekeeper is going to tell you they, he loses 30% of his hives a year. If a cow farmer or a corn grower or an apple producer lost 30% of their crop every year, they'd be going, like you'd call, they called in the National Guard when cows were starving in Montana. Um, but beekeepers, all they have to do is they split their colony in half, they put another queen in, and they can fill in these holes very good. And in a way, they've become their worst nightmare because every time they have these collapses, they're able to fill the gap. Despite this quick fix solution of splitting hives, beekeepers still came up short. In the last few years, there have not been enough American bees to pollinate the almond crop. And the almond growers went to the government, to the USDA, and said, we need more bees. Can we import them from other countries? And so uh, three years ago, I believe it was, um, permission was granted to bring in bees from Australia. Um, and bees began arriving by 747, landing at, at SFO airport and getting trucked to the Central Valley and then very confused bees, you know, coming from the other side of the world, um, the, the precise opposite season, uh, got to work pollinating the almonds. Bees are now being shipped across oceans to deal with the shortage. 
an action in itself unsustainable. And still, American scientists have failed to isolate the cause of the vanishing bees. Well, no, these we targeted because they looked like they had CCD. And so we have some sort of shot in the dark ideas. So you're trying to restore them or trying yeah, to re Yeah, to see if we can get them to bounce back and not die. Because we would have expected all these colonies to be dead within a couple weeks. Oh, okay. So, well, like this one's going to be dead in a couple weeks. Like we're trying to see if there's a a way, you know, of uh, dealing with collapsing colonies. We're not, like, I mean, it's not like we hold much hope for any of this, but... Majority of the cases, those colonies that collapsed from CCD did not have an immediate problem with veromites or no SEMA disease. So I think we've ruled a bunch of stuff out and we're, and we're honing in on a couple of remaining factors. Holistic beekeepers take an opposite approach to keeping bees than the large migratory operations. Having far fewer hives and not trucking them for pollination are just a few of the contrasts in their practice. Equally stung with a love of bees, these men and women recognize a different set of suspects to explain the puzzling bee disappearances. In central western Illinois, we are starting a biodynamic farm. And in the heart of the farm is a honeybee sanctuary, a sanctuary where the honeybee can be treated in a way that she's not exploited or looked at only as something to profit from. We consciously came here. I chose the site here in Illinois because we are in the heartland and that's where the greatest damages are. We are surrounded by Monsanto corn and by Monsanto soy. That, those are the main crops. People in Iowa and in Illinois here can't drink their own well water anymore because it's so poisonous. I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing if I wouldn't have hope that we can turn things around bit by bit. We want to make salves and ointments and healing products from what the bees give us, the wax and the propolis and the honey. And of course, then teach how to take care of bees in a different way so we can build up the immune system, build up their innate strength. One common practice Guntar feels compromises the health and vitality of honeybees is the way commercial beekeepers treat the queen bee. While worker bees and drones live only a few weeks or months, a queen bee can live up to five years. She is the mother of every bee in her hive. Commercial beekeepers routinely kill the queen after only a few months and replace her with a younger, artificially raised one. Beekeepers remove the queen from the hive, pinch her head, and then introduce a surrogate in a cage. The cage prevents the colony from killing the foreign queen until they adapt to her scent. And the way of queen breeding, this mechanized artificial way of queen breeding is the gist of the attack on the honeybee. Another practice holistic beekeepers feel is undermining the health of honeybees is artificial insemination. The queen bee is knocked out with carbon dioxide and knocked up with semen collected from male drones. They do this to select for specific traits, but critics feel it narrows the gene pool. I'm just opening the, the vaginal chamber of the queen. So I grab the forceps, and if I pull the sting over, 
it's a little flap of tissue that you have to get around. So you're putting semen directly in the ovary duct. And then you measure out, you know, you measure out so much semen, you measure out eight microliters. Give her the equivalent of eight to 10 drones. Um, and then you just back that out and release the queen. And she is ready to be put in a, her mating nook. She looks a little rough, but she'll come around in a few minutes. Another industrialized beekeeping method under suspicion is the practice of taking honey away from the bees and filling hives with sugar syrup. That's like feeding your kids junk food and then them feeding their kids junk food. Push that over a hundred generations. How healthy are your great, great, great grandchildren going to be? That's what we've done with the honeybee. We fed them empty sugars when they should be receiving the rich diet of raw nectars from the flower. The privilege of being a beekeeper is not to generate as much honey as possible. We keep bees so we can contribute to pollination. And actually the future of beekeeping is not in one beekeeper with 60,000 hives. Rather, it's 60,000 people with one hive. All of them approaching the art and the craft of being a keeper of bees as a holistic practice. Dee Lusby is considered the queen bee of the organic beekeeping movement. By early 2008, her organic beekeeping Yahoo group had over a thousand members prompting her to hold the first annual organic beekeeping conference. Organic beekeepers do not feed their bees sugar syrups or artificial pollen substitutes commonly used by commercial outfits. They also stand fervently against the use of miticides, toxic chemicals some beekeepers put in their own hives to combat mites. A decorated Vietnam veteran, Dee resides in the remote desert outside Tucson and eats a gallon of honey every week. What do you think CCD is? I think it's a combination that when the bee is out of sync with nature, nature's gonna come in with all types of parasites, all types of viruses, bacteria, fungus, diseases, and they're going to take down what shouldn't belong there. It's a sad state because they're forced, a lot of these people are forced to go migratory because they cannot sell their honey and make a living. And by being forced to go migratory, they're forced to go into factory farming. And once they're on the road where they don't have access for foraging, then they're forced to artificially feed them. And then if they artificially feed them and they're on the road and something happens, Normally, every move you make, you lose 10% of your queens, then you're forced to buy artificial queens. And once you're forced into the migratory, you're forced into a system like that's like going down a road to hell. I wouldn't be here keeping these bees today if it wouldn't be for pollination. I mean, we can't we can't compete with the world honey prices because China and Argentina and all them people have got us just pinned up against the wall. Four or five years ago, honey came in here with or chlorophenicol in it. You ever hear that antibiotic? It causes aplastic anemia, and it was in the honey from China, and they found it and stopped it. And now the guy is bringing in uh, honey blends and, uh, and selling it as honey. These are uh, container loads of honey coming into this country. They're uh, blends of honey. This one right here is um, four container loads of honey with lactose syrup in it. Now, that's made from milk. 
I mean, every one of these has, has got a blend of something, and this one here has got high fructose corn syrup. But here's another one that brought in three loads with beet sugar in it, and that same honey is sitting right up here. Is this where you're gonna take us? Yeah, don't show this on camera. Okay. You can look at it right here. Matter of fact, just cut, you got the camera off? Turn it off. We can't stay here too long now, because they're gonna be suspicious. See this big pile of green drums right here? Yep. All right, that is the blend. That's the fake honey. It'll all say uh, product of China on there. Yeah, product of China. But it's coming in at some ridiculous assessed value where there's no duties on it. They declared the value at 18 cents a pound. And people at customs let them do it. Hell, there ain't no honey at 18 cents a pound. You can't even buy water at 18 cents a pound. You can't do anything. And this guy's just been doing it for years and, and destroying the whole industry. If you took out all the funny honey, we call it funny honey, that's not pure honey. If you took that off the market, it's coming into this country. Maybe the price of honey would go up. But the problem of it is, you know, FDA doesn't really care. You had to go to all the bakeries like General Mills, Pillsbury, uh, Kellogg's, whoever. But uh, it's just a shame to see how this country is going to wake up one day and there's not going to be any bees left and people are going to be asking why aren't there the fruits and vegetables that we normally buy at, at the stores and they're going to tell them, say, well, the ship didn't come in from Central or South America somewhere, so we won't have anything this week, come back next week. And people aren't going to be used to that. We're somewhere around 35% of the, of the fruits and vegetables we eat now are already imported. And, you know, there's a train of thought out here in, in, in some areas of agriculture that, you know, that in another 10 years, we're going to be importing most of our fruits and vegetables. Food's going to come from China now. The food's going to come from Mexico. But if we get in a world that hurts and they need the food for themselves, then who's going to feed us? I don't know of anybody. In early 2008, honeybee die-offs were still occurring all over the world, and no common link had been discovered as the cause. As scientists continued to search for a solution, migratory beekeepers struggled to fulfill their pollination contract. Tending to the first crop of the year, and the most profitable for beekeepers, Hackenberg and Mendez worked side by side, inspecting hives in the almond orchards of California. There's no pollen right there. Let's see what the bottom looks like. Well, they might not be healthy. Here's the queen. Happy, happy. She is. She's pretty, too. Yeah. Isn't yeah, I mean, that gorgeous? Yeah. They're laying eggs. That's a positive sign. That means they're... Uh, they're happy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hello? Hackenberg and Mendez got word that their friend and fellow beekeeper, Brett Aidy, had just discovered a massive collapse of his hives. They drove over to witness what would be the worst case of colony collapse disorder ever recorded. 40,000 beehives had gone from healthy colonies to empty boxes in a matter of weeks. Two billion bees gone. What, you, this is a photo opportunity? Is this a Kodak photo spot? I guess. It keeps going all the way up into the hill. Every semi spot. In the back of your mind, you can imagine, you, you think you have an idea what this looks like. You can't, you can't imagine this. This is like the pictures of the Holocaust. This is, uh, this is a bee Holocaust right here. I just want to see if there's dead, there, there should be, this is what's disturbing. There should be dead, yeah. you see, this many hives, that's not enough dead bees here for this many hives. I had a bad day in that bee yard in Ruskin, Florida when I lost 400 hives of bees. 
standing in Brett's 80s B yard out here, you know, 15 miles west of here. That's one of the one of the worst days of my life. I mean, standing there watching, looking at, I mean, the devastation. I seen one hive sitting there. I don't know if there's any bees left in it. I don't know if there's anything here or not. Just a little drizzle, a few bees there. They're not enough. They're not viable. No, they they're gone. They just they just don't know it yet. There's like six bees there. There's no queen. So this last meeting in Sacramento, this beekeepers meeting, there were several beekeepers that walked up to Hackenberg and said, you know, I owe, I owe you an apology. I heard you talk about this a year ago and I thought you were just a bad beekeeper. And now I've seen this in my own hives and uh, I was all wrong. With colony collapse disorder striking the second year in a row, scientists still had not found a smoking gun. Slowly, the investigation turned to the farming practices that had made us so dependent upon bees in the first place. where the farmer had pigs and they grew some corn and they had a large garden and they had chickens. So the farms were diversified. That was the typical American farm. Today, what we have are farmers who grow corn or farmers who have an apple orchard, one or the other. They don't grow corn and have apples. It's large, large acreages, uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of acres of one thing. That's a monoculture. they're not likely to be a lot of bees around a monoculture. Why is that? Because for 50 weeks a year in that monoculture, there is nothing to eat. So what bee would ever hang around? You'd have to be stupid. It contradicts the logic of the natural world. You don't find monocultures in nature. Uh, nature just doesn't work that way. Nature doesn't put all her eggs in one basket. Um, so in order to keep a monoculture going, you need a lot of intervention. Once you have monoculture, you need pesticides because pests love monocultures. You know, every plant, every animal has its pests or diseases. And when that pest or disease encounters a monoculture, it's a party. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's so much food that its population explodes. It makes it a, a real struggle to control pests because they, once they get established, all that they need is there and they can really, really take off. So to uphold monoculture farming, we spray our crops with deadly chemicals. But when did the widespread use of pesticides begin? How were they invented? Here in Germany, in Leverkusen, actually there was a school for chemical warfare in the First um, World War. And the German army was the first one to introduce um, chemical warfare. And after the um, First World War, when there was not much need for chemical warfare, they kind of co-invented pesticides. It was the civilian use of nearly the same class of warfare chemicals. And these were munitions, these were chemicals used in munitions being transferred to use in the private sector. And this was viewed by the chemical companies as a perfect transformation of their industry. Chemical warfare and pesticides are just the two sides of one metal. It's um, chemically nearly identical, and it was the same companies and even the same persons who invented um, these substances. I mean, we've taken things that was left over from World War II and made chemicals out of them for agriculture to feed ourselves. I mean, we tried to kill people with this stuff, and now we're trying, trying to kill the bugs with it, and then we're trying to eat the stuff. So, you know, does it make a lot of sense? I don't think so, but you know, I'm just a dumb beekeeper. As pesticides moved from the battlefields onto the marketplace, the chemicals did not always deliver the great benefits they promised. With the possibility of a serious infantile paralysis epidemic, 
health authorities of the city of San Antonio, Texas, attacked the germ carriers throughout the city. With the war discovered DDT in special sprayers, sections of the city are blanketed with the insecticide in the fight to stop the spread of the dread poliomyelitis. Tons of DDT are used in this fight against the dread disease, whose principal target is the young. Again, war has contributed one of its discoveries to save life. DDT, chlorpyrifos, chemical after chemical that were defended, these chemicals were defended as representing acceptable risks in one decade and banned in the next as unacceptable. I don't like to use more chemicals, but it would be just, nice not to have to it'd be nice not to have to use them. But you, can't, you cannot raise a good crop without using chemicals. If we tried to go back to growing everything organically, the insects, if you have done any studying at all, you would find the insects would take over the world if we didn't uh, use means to control them. Pesticides are designed to kill bugs that damage crops, but spraying these chemicals has often caused big problems for the little bee. Honeybees and uh, pesticides have always had some interaction, mostly negative, that uh, because bees are put on crops and crops are usually sprayed in some way with, often with pesticides, they've had a long history of being impacted by pesticides. I've been in the pollination business right from the beginning and I've worked around pesticides uh, always. And, and there's been a strong move in this country to get away from um, the old style pesticides. When you had a problem and, and, and the bees got into some kind of spray, right away you knew it. There was, there was uh, dead bees, a uh, drop in the population. Until recently, farmers applied pesticides topically by spraying their crops. Beekeepers could protect their bees by moving them away during spraying. If pesticides did cause a problem, they could tell from the dead bees surrounding the hives. Eventually, the older style pesticides were replaced by newer, supposedly safer ones. Unlike the old, short-lived chemicals, these systemic pesticides remained within the plant throughout its life. Most conventional pesticides, you have a, will you say a tomato plant? You spray the material over the plant, insect feeds on the leaves and it dies. Systemic pesticides, you feed it in irrigation or you put it on the seed, it then gets incorporated, it moves within the plant itself and can either be expressed in the leaves, it's, it's circulating in the leaves, or in, in some cases it can be expressed in, in the pollen and the nectar when that plant blooms. These pesticides kill insects by inflicting sublethal damage. They weaken immune systems, disrupt digestion, impair navigational abilities, and subtly harm the brain. These effects can be particularly detrimental to colonial insects like honeybees. If lost or separated from the colony, a single honeybee cannot survive for more than 24 hours without her hive. Since their introduction, systemic pesticides have become the fastest growing insecticides in the world. With brand names like Gaucho and Poncho, they came to be widely used in the U.S. in 2003, not long before the advent of colony collapse disorder. With the newer style pesticides, the systemics, you can have exposure and, and have no symptoms for many months. But when the symptoms do occur, it's it's devastating. Products that are being used right now have been tested uh, and, and found to be safe around bees. And that, that's true on a lethal dose. You, when the bees go to the flower, it does, it's not enough product to kill them. But the issue of what's brought back to the hive and what's fed to the bees in their developmental stages is not only not required to be studied, it, all that research is absent. It, it doesn't exist. What we're concerned about is low-level, sublethal doses over a long period of time and what effect that has on, on the health of the bees. But measuring the sublethal damage done by pesticides was challenging. Marion Fraser, a research scientist at Penn State University, began to explore whether pesticides, 
and particularly these new systemic pesticides could explain the nation's dwindling honeybee population. In order to look at the impact of pesticides, we have to collect samples. And so we collect these samples of either honey or pollen, or in the field, we might collect samples of bees and or wax. The initial question was, you know, are pesticides, and in particular, systemic pesticides, causing CCD? What we did was participate in the large CCD project. And from that, we found an incredible amount of pesticides. And the question then became much more complicated. Yes, the pesticides are there, there's no doubt. What is the impact of those pesticides? What, what are they doing to the bees is now the question. This idea that these pesticides that we're seeing at very, very small levels are causing sublethal effects is a much more difficult thing to try to diagnose, to try to, to understand. The fact that they, again, might be interfering with the, the nervous system of the bees and thus interfering with their ability to, to learn or to remember, or their immune system, interfering with their ability to have a strong, healthy immune system to be able to fight off diseases. With colony collapse devastating bees for a second year, the plight of these prime pollinators moved to the nation's capital where a congressional hearing was held to discuss honeybee health. David Hackenberg and Dave Mendez traveled to Washington, D.C. to voice their concerns about their bees and our environment. In February of last year, top agriculture researchers in conjunction with USDA termed this massive decline in honeybees as colony collapse disorder and set out to pinpoint the cause of this problem. Many beekeepers in my district have been financially and emotionally devastated by the rapid loss of their bee colonies. Next up, uh, I'd like to call on Mr. David Mendez, Vice President of the American Beekeeping Federation from North Myers, Florida. Welcome, sir, the floor is yours. I would like to be able to tell you that over the last 18 months, we have figured out the cause of CCD, but that would not be an accurate statement. What I can tell you is that many beekeepers have a pretty good idea of what is hurting their bees. What's happened now, um, these, these uh, new products, these systemics, they can be applied to the soil, they can be applied uh, foliarly, they can be seed treated on, on corn, for instance. My own experience and experience of several beekeepers is you bring your bees to an area where these products are being used, several months later they're collapsing. The bees that you left in the woods far away from, from those crops, they're just fine. I am sure that most of the people at this hearing are aware of recent actions in Germany to restrict the use of many systemic pesticides. This follows regulatory actions originally implemented in France to limit the use of these products until they can be clearly proven to be safe to honeybees and other beneficial insects. Bees disappearing from their hives would have been of great concern to Napoleon Bonaparte, who made honeybees a symbol of his reign. The oldest beekeeping school in the world still exists in the Jardin de Luxembourg, and hives can even be found listening to the arias on the roof of the Paris Opera House. Fifteen years ago, bees in France began to disappear in a manner similar to colony collapse disorder, which they called Mad bee disease. Quand on était à Melbourne, en Australie, on a eu un après-midi à Pimondia sur les mortalités d'abeilles. Et il y avait un chercheur américain. J'avais l'impression d'entendre ce qui se disait en France il y a dix ans. Ça a commencé dans les années 1995. Et on s'est aperçu que c'était arrivé en même temps que le gaucho, le produit de chez Bayer. On a filmé en France des tournesols biologiques et des tournesols traditionnels traités gaucho. Et on a regardé le comportement des abeilles. Sur les tournesols biologiques, on voit les abeilles qui butinent les fleurons après fleurons, mais d'une manière très rythmée, très efficace, un vrai butinage. Et sur les tournesols euh, traités gaucho ou régents, les abeilles déjà ne se trouvent pas sur les bons fleurons, parfois elles sont sur la périphérie. 
et d'autre part, elles se mettent à se gratter et puis elles tombent. Et à l'époque, quand c'est arrivé en France, on a parlé du mal français des abeilles. Et je ne suis pas persuadé, d'ailleurs on n'en parle plus aujourd'hui, qu'on puisse dire qu'il y a un mal français des abeilles, ou qu'il y a un mal américain, ou qu'il y a un mal italien, ou un mal australien, ou un mal espagnol ou allemand, euh, qu'on le nomme Sicilie ou qu'on le nomme des populations d'abeilles. Decrying the massive bee deaths to be much more than a bad beekeeping issue, French beekeepers took to the streets. Thousands gathered to stage protests in cities across France, at the Eiffel Tower, and in front of Bayer Crop Science, the company that manufactures the systemic pesticides in question, like Gaucho and Poncho. Pourquoi vous avez fait ça, monsieur Pardon Pourquoi vous avez fait ça Pour manifester, on va faire un gros tas de, de ruches crevées devant. On va faire voir ce que c'est que des ruches crevées. Malheureusement, il n'y a pas les abeilles, parce qu'on ne sait pas où elles sont. Et voilà ce qu'il nous reste. Qu'est-ce que ça signifie, ça, monsieur Ça, c'est un apiculteur qui est mort parce qu'il ne peut plus travailler avec ses abeilles, comme les abeilles. Si les abeilles meurent, les apiculteurs aussi. Je pense qu'au début, on a énormément surpris la société Bayer. Parce que pour eux, les apiculteurs, c'était euh, des babacous, des gens un peu poètes, qui avaient quelques ruches au fond du jardin, qui étaient tout à fait individualistes, qui n'avaient pas de moyens, qui étaient divisés parce qu'il y avait plusieurs syndicats, etc., et qu'ils n'en feraient qu'une bouchée. Et puis en fait, on s'est rassemblés, on a pris, comme je vous l'ai dit, euh, on a pris un avocat et on a fait de grosses actions juridiques, on a eu les preuves scientifiques et... Tout ça a fait qu'on a su se défendre, qu'on a réussi à obtenir des résultats en France. Reviewing the evidence in the courtroom and listening to the cries of the public, the French Minister of Agriculture banned the systemic pesticides on corn and sunflowers. J'ai pris mes responsabilités sur le gaucho. Ça prouve que euh, je sais bien qu'il s'agit de défendre l'environnement, euh, ce ministère est, est aussi à la pointe du combat. J'ai pensé que les apiculteurs me le demandaient, compte tenu de, de, dans leur immense majorité, me le demandaient compte tenu des troubles que ça provoquait dans leur, dans leur production. Je l'ai fait. To learn more about the bands, Hackenberg and Mendez traveled across the Atlantic to an international beekeeping conference in France. Henri Clement invited them to speak and compare notes with European beekeepers and scientists firsthand. Can you go all the way to the top? I think you can. Or something like that. It's very important to have a relation between the different mm -hmm. keepers in France, in Europe, in this, because uh, it's a great problem. It's not uh, uh, only Valois. Or no, 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 no. It's pesticides. Well, we, we think so too. The problem we have in the States is that we need the science. We still don't have the science that, yes. that's, that's enough for the, for the government. What we find is the pesticides start, they, they, they start the process, and then the viruses are yes, a problem. Yes, okay, okay, yes, yes, but no. For me, <laughs> the problem is the in first is pesticides, yes. and the effect of pesticides. Mm -hmm. Viruses, Nozema serrana, yes. Varroa is a pro more When problem. When you are intoxicated, you? Yes, yes. que je remercie, je crois qu'ils viennent de très loin, ils ont traversé l'Atlantique. Nous, nous les remercions chaleureusement. Spring of 2004, we put bees on, on apples in upstate New York and they were sprayed with a sale, which is a systemic bear product. The scientists are finding it in, in the pollen, they're finding it 
you know, we're finding it, it's not a problem of finding it, it's what we're going to do about it because our, our environmental protection folks have put it out there and it's now our responsibility to prove to them that there's a problem. One of our goals in coming here to, to Europe is to, to learn what research, what science you've already worked on so that we can bring it home and, and use it for, uh, to, to change our laws also. Vous avez récolte de pollen, on ne voit absolument rien. Et en fonction du moment où elles vont reconsommer le pollen dans la ruche, et ça peut se trouver six mois après, on peut voir. En pulsation des cultures, le pollen. En hiver, elles consomment le pollen qui est dans la ruche. C'est très difficile de prouver. À cause de ce scénario, c'est très difficile à prouver. On ne sait pas mettre la cause à l'effet. Because of the time. Yeah. You can't link the cause and the effect. We suspect that when it's in the pollen, it's it's affecting the bees a different way in their developmental stages. Yeah. That the bees that hatch out, their nervous system is affected in some way, so that they don't show any physical difference. But something's wrong with them, and, and it and it seems to take more than one generation. We had the opportunity to sit down with scientists and beekeepers here and, and talk about our problems and their problems, and and for the most part, you know, there's some differences, but for the most part, they they seem to be you know quite the same. Beekeepers worldwide had similar suspicions and followed France's lead, staging protests. British beekeepers called for research funding to address the bee crisis. When do we want it? Now! We don't want much. You've given it to the banks. We want eight million. Save our bees. Save our agriculture. Concerned over bee health, countries like Italy, Germany, and Slovenia also placed bans on certain systemic pesticides that beekeepers and others believe underlie the mystifying symptoms of colony collapse disorder. Abbiamo una delegazione degli apicoltori francesi a cui diamo un ringraziamento. Most European governments use the precautionary principle when approving the use of pesticides. This places safety as the main priority when regulating toxic chemicals, intending for errors to always fall on the side of caution. The other thing, the interesting thing about Europe is they're they're living in a different idea. They're in the precautionary. You know, we we're going to. We're going to take precautions. If we think it's a problem, we're going to take it off the market until we figure this thing out. Here in the United States, we're just the opposite. We just put it out there, and we see what happens, you know? The EPA decides whether or not to approve a pesticide based on what is called risk assessment. This practice allows for exposing the public to risk as long as the EPA determines those risks are reasonable. The problem, however, is because of our failed regulatory systems, we're still not asking the full range of questions that need to be asked before we register these chemicals. And one of the things we're not asking adequately are the sublethal effects EPA of EPA regulations deal with lethal doses to adult bees. Their perception is they've done their job, but there's a big hole missing. When they change the, the nature of the pesticides, the way, the mode of action, they needed to change the regulation, and that did not occur. Another problem beekeepers have with the EPA's approval process is sometimes referred to as the fox guarding the hen house. But who funds research? Do you, do you know how EPA works in this country? EPA doesn't do any research. The manufacturer does all the research. They submit it to EPA, and they either say yes or no, or we need more information. When I talked to the state, the, the folks in the state here to ask them about it, and I, and I said, well, 
University of Florida or USDA, who's, who's done the research on this? They referred me to the toxicologist at Bayer. I picked up the phone, I talked to him, I spoke to the toxicologist. He said, I'll send you the studies. He sent me the studies. I look at them. They put imidacloprid in sugar syrup. They feed it to adult bees. They look at one days, two days, three days, and that's the, the end of the story. And when I, when I spoke to the toxicologist, I said, how about the brood, the developing? We don't look there. We don't have, we don't to. have to. So the agency whose job it is to actually decide whether pesticides are safe relies on the data supplied by the very companies who would most profit from their use. I don't know. They really should take protection out of their out of their out of their label because they ain't protecting nothing. I mean, they're just you know they're not protecting anything. They're just the environmental whatever. You know? People discount the the whole argument about uh, pesticides. They say, well, you've been around pesticides for years. You know what's different now? Well, this is what's different: is the residuals. How long the products last? The systemics are designed to have long residuals. When they're used over a period of time, they leave a long-lasting residue in the soil, and they accumulate with time. And what hasn't been looked at very much yet is that accumulation over time and what that does. How, what is the level at, after a period of time? Is it enough to kill a bee? Probably. To us, this begs the question, what are these pesticides in combination doing? We all know that when we go to the pharmacist, the first thing they want to know is what other prescriptions are you taking? Because they're concerned about the potential interaction of compounds. We know that some of these things synergize, that together two of these things can be more toxic than either one can be on its own. It's like going back to chemistry class, you know, you took a a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it was fine. You dumped it out, and everything was fine. You poured it together, and it's still okay. Then you got the third thing, you dumped it in, and started to sizzle a little bit. And you found something else where you dumped it in, and all of a sudden, boom, you blowed the whole place up. Synergism has never been really looked at. Nobody has ever tested it. They don't have to, because the rules doesn't, that's not what the rules at EPA say. The real answer to why a federal agency like EPA in the U.S. is not asking what is obvious or what any scientist would think is logical is the chemical company influence. We put agencies like the EPA in place to moderate the avarice of corporations and they have not done it. Instead they've been corrupted. I cynically say that they've become a, a bunch of pestitutes. I tell people, when they ask me about something, I say, well, I've got to ask the bees. And they say, well, what are you, Dr. Doolittle? Do you, do you talk to the bees? And I said, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a verbal exchange, but if you want, you, you can have all the theories in the world, but you have to go out and ask the bees. The bees are telling us that this is a complex issue, but the human brain I think, believes that we know better and we can identify the one cause of the problem when in fact there are a constellation of complex factors that interrelate, coexist, create synergies, additive and cumulative effects that the scientific process does not measure. In one sense, it's a mystery. We don't know exactly what's responsible. Is it a particular virus? Is it a particular pesticide? And there are many conflicting theories. But in the larger sense, we know exactly what's responsible, and that is these huge monocultures uh, in American agriculture and world agriculture that are making bees' lives very difficult and creating conditions where uh, they're vulnerable to disease and exposed to pesticides. In our, in our culture, scientists have 
uh, have the last word, the ultimate authority in commenting on matters having to do with biology. There are other forms of knowledge, very powerful forms of knowledge about biology. Uh, there is local knowledge. There's the knowledge of beekeepers. There's the knowledge of people who, uh, you know, are just really great observers of the natural world. The pesticide scientists say, well, you know, the science doesn't, doesn't say this. Well, science, their science may not say this, but I'm living in a world of real reality. These bees are reality. We should listen, because very often traditional knowledge gets there before the scientists. We do know that in these same areas, every time we encounter corn, soybeans, and all these crops that have been treated with systemic pesticides, the bees fall apart. In American agriculture, more than 95% of the food we eat is treated with pesticides. Over a billion pounds of these toxic chemicals are used on crops annually. What could be driving the U.S. to produce food in such a way? I don't think the farmer is looking for the quick fix. The farmer is part of the whole system that's based on production um, quantity, cheap food. Cheap food is not as cheap as it looks. You pay the price eventually. You pay it in, in terms of uh, environmental damage. You pay it in terms of future health damage. And food that looks expensive today may not be in the long term if it helps keep you healthier. Well, big agriculture, you know, and, and the people that drive big agriculture, you know, the, the chemical companies, the seed companies, and everybody else, you know, have got this mentality that the fact is, you know, another 10 years, we're not going to grow fruits and vegetables. That we're going to be the, the corn, soybean, cotton, canola producing country of the world and, and uh, let everybody else produce their fruits and vegetables. 20 years ago, the average crop of corn, the average yield per acre was 75 uh, bushels to the acre. Today it's 150 bushels. Genetically modified crops, systemic pesticides, um, they're predicting to go to 300 bushel per acre in another 20 years. This is seen as success. Uh, whether the quality of that, that corn is the same, uh, whether it makes us sick or, or what it does to us is, is secondary. My take on colony collapse is it, it, it is one of the signs, the really unmistakable signs, that our food system is, is unsustainable. That word that we all throw around but means something very specific, which is to say, um, it's destroying the conditions upon which it depends. It has internal contradictions that will lead to breakdown. The question of whether we can actually feed the world with that toxic chemicals, I think has long been answered. Uh, despite all our modern ingenuity, we have the same degree of crop loss today that we had before the pesticide revolution. You know, we're still losing about a third of our crop in conventional agriculture to infestations. That's a, that's a big loss, and we never lost more than that, and we never will lose more than that in non-chemical systems. While safer alternatives exist, the current agricultural landscape impacts more than just the honeybee. Many feel other life on Earth has also been adversely impacted by pesticide residuals moving through our ecosystem. You know, it's this this issue of the pest, systemic pesticide just in the honeybees. This is this is all the you know all the native pollinators. I mean, you know, the bats, the hummingbirds, the other solitary bees. Not only birds, fish, and insects are put at risk from the widespread use of pesticides. The reality itself, aside from what's moral or not, should be driving us to step back and question whether all the money in the world can buy us an environment or good health. And, you know, obviously the answer is it can't. We're not killing people with pesticides, per se. We don't see the dead bodies by the hives or in the streets, but we're causing enough deterioration of of systems in the body causing autism in humans or we're causing learning disabilities and we're causing 
mechanisms in bees to erode to the extent that they can't barge correctly or navigate correctly. In 2010, late fall of 2009, 2010, looks like this is gonna be the worst loss of bees since, you know, CCD has started. What I've done, and, and other beekeepers have done, is I'm gonna be 400 miles away from home this spring to keep my bees away from areas that, that I think are gonna hurt them. You have to be accepting of the fact that no matter what you do, you do all the right things, a third of them are gonna die. We're in a war somewhat here, and, and we're gonna lose a percentage of our troops consistently. We're, we're gonna keep fighting. To help beekeepers in their fight, one of America's leading environmental groups has come to the aid of the honeybees. NRDC sued EPA in federal court in New York because EPA had messed up the registration of the systemic pesticide Movento. Our attention at NRDC was called to this issue by beekeepers who noticed that their, their hives were literally depopulated. And one of the odd things about this particular chemical is that you didn't see, for example, a pile of dead bees outside the hive. They just disappeared. NRDC has won every step of the way and has stopped the retail sale of, of the systemic pesticide Movento. Worldwide, beekeepers, scientists, and concerned citizens have recognized systemic pesticides as a problem. And now, many are looking to France to see if the bans have led to any improvements. Que dans les régions où ces produits ont été retirés et où ils n'ont pas été remplacés, les abeilles se sont nettement mieux portées au bout d'un an. L'avenir de l'abeille, c'est un défi à relever, qui, comme l'énergie, comme l'eau, comme les transports, Définira la viabilité de l'homme sur la planète. Initially, Gunther Hawk hoped to bring healing to the heartlands. But after witnessing the ill effects of big agribusiness, he decided to relocate far away from monoculture farming. We had to move from the farm in Illinois, the 610 acre farm and we found this wonderful place in Virginia, in Floyd, where we are not surrounded by Monsanto corn and soy, but by pastures and fields and hay fields. The bees are the life guarantors of nature itself, so we have to try, we have to try to take care of them. By taking care of them, we take care of ourselves. Einstein said a beautiful uh, word. He said, we cannot change the problems that we have with the same mindset that, they, that have caused them. Our mindset has to undergo a great transformation. I think this approach to more sustainable agriculture where you're incorporating places for native pollinators and, and native wildlife and, and other plants um, and pesticide-free areas for insects, I think that's the future. I don't think, it's, I don't think it's going back to how we farmed 100 years ago. I think it's looking at modern farming and making sure modern farming lives in harmony with the environment. Right now, in 2010, the Organic Beekeepers is up to uh, about 3,400 members going for 4,000. And yet, when I started, it was like, let's see if you can get 300. So it's, it's grown. According to one perspective, colony collapse disorder is a blessing in disguise. Not only has it placed bees at the forefront of our consciousness, the widespread concern has sparked a surge of hobby beekeepers. Folks are helping bees and everything else by bringing these fuzzy pollinators into their own neighborhoods. The buzz prompted the city of New York to legalize beekeeping in the five boroughs, 
On March 24, 2010, the Big Apple changed legislation following the lead of cities like Seattle, Chicago, and San Francisco. In France, they march in the streets with their tractors and the government changes things. In the United States, it doesn't work that way. People need to call their congressmen and senators and complain. Tell them, hey, I don't like the way things are. I'm concerned about what I'm eating. I'm concerned about the bees. I'm concerned about all the other insects that are disappearing. One of the things that I've realized in America is that politicians respond to letters. Um, and I also know that they respond to the media. I don't know if any of you guys have heard about this article in the New York Times. Well, apparently, honeybees are disappearing all over the country. Tens of millions of them just disappearing. There's no bodies, no sign of them. They're just mysteriously gone. It's scary, huh? No bees means no honey. It's nature's way of saying, can you hear me now? <laughs> Where my bees at? Support your local organic farmer. Plant a seed. Make the planet a healthy place where the bees can thrive. By saving the bees, we save a lot more than the bees. There are practical solutions you and I can do every day to save the bees. The first place to start is at home by cutting the use of toxic chemicals in our houses and on our lawns. Safe alternatives to pesticides and holistic gardening practices are often more effective than the poisons, which have run amok in the suburbs as well as the cornfields. We don't have to wait for the government to act on some of these issues. Even though it's important the government do act, we can do something today. We get to vote three times a day for what we're going to eat and what we're not going to eat. And both decisions are equally important. So that voting with your fork is, you know, a very powerful thing. And um, by doing so, you can, you can nurture the food systems that will uh, take better care of the bees. Choosing organic produce is another effective way to help the bees and keep you and your planet healthy. More bee saving can be done by shopping at the local farmer's market which provides both a fun outing and delicious, healthy food. If these options aren't available or organic food seems too expensive, you can plant a garden and grow your own organic produce. Even people living in apartments can keep window gardens. You know, do you have a lawn? Lawns don't offer much to bees. They don't offer much to us either. Rip out your lawn and put it in a garden. Put in flowering plants. Um, create habitat for bees. It's not very hard to attract bees to your property. We wanted to have a vegetable garden because this is the first time that we lived in a house with a, how we could have a garden. And I had been hearing a lot about bees not having enough food because of urbanization. And we decided... To plant some. Yep. So we got a gardening we book. We built this. We did build this. Hello. And I, I just love that my daughter's learning a, like a, to have a love of nature. To have just a little bit of nature in your, your yard is nice. The plight of the little bee has also inspired gardens in big places. In the spring of 2009, First Lady Michelle Obama planted an organic garden at the White House. And to help the fruits and vegetables grow, the garden holds a beehive. We can make it a change in this thing for the good of not only the honeybees, but for everybody else.